Praise the Lord. Thank you, Pastor Lloyd. <clears throat> Greetings once again. And um, like I said to the first group, um, I think, my friend, there, you're doing interpretation. I figured that much. All right. So we want to really give God thanks. I'm happy to be here. I'm overwhelmed. I'm, I'm, I'm just so thankful to God for this privilege and this opportunity at all times. Um, leave it up to me. You know I always say, I'll, re I'll move myself right back home. Praise the Lord. But God is doing great things. Um, my friend Andrea, we had great plans, and we plan to be here in Guyana at this time. And I'm thankful to God. She's a faithful follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, along with her mom and her son and her grandkids and so, and so forth. And I'm thankful to God. We're a great encouragement to each other. We spend a lot of time chatting and interacting. Um, like she said, we know each other from yesteryear. And God is good. Praise the Lord. I just want to encourage you once again, like I encouraged the first, in the first session. I had shared, and I'm sharing again, our journey. And I thought it was very important and very critical because this is what the Lord gave to me to share with us today. And I know God is speaking to us as a people here at South Road Assembly. Amen? The story that captures our journey is in the book of Ruth. I remember the first time going to the U.S. Embassy in Guyana here to apply a visitor's visa. And we were all confident we had these great plans and, you know, it was this whole thing about nursing and it was, the, the atmosphere was very favorable towards nursing. And I felt at that time that I'd reached my zenith here in, a, in, a, in Guyana and there was no way further for us to go because we couldn't do a bachelor's degree. We couldn't afford our, our education. And of course, you know, our parents can't afford to send us to Jamaica to pay for college or, or university. So I decided that we're, I'm going to step out. But then the Lord says, mm -mm. I was denied that visa, but the person, the officer who interviewed me, he was looking for a reason to give me this visa. And he asked me all sorts of questions. And then in the end, he probably wasn't satisfied. So he says, come back. I left a little bit disappointed, but in the end, what matters is what's God's will for our lives. Went home and I dismissed that thought. I left it alone. My brother-in-law, they go back, go back. That's my husband's brother. Nevertheless, that was that. And then the Lord brought a word to me. He said, remember Naomi. She went out full and came back empty. I'm going to read a little bit from Ruth. Chapter 1. Now it came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Emelech. And the name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of their sons were Malian and Chilion. Ephratites of Bethlehem in Judah. Now they entered the land of Moab and remained there. And Emelech, Naomi's husband, had died. And she was left with her two sons. And they took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of one was Orpha, and the other one was Ruth. And they lived there about ten years. Then both Malian and Chilion died. And the woman was bereaved of her two children and her husband. And the story goes on. She arose and she went back to Jerusalem. You know, what is critical and important, and one of the things I, I started off by receiving this word about our purpose. But it's purpose, it's so many things we put on purpose. But then the Lord reminded me this morning, I just couldn't sleep last night. He said, it's more of assignment. God has an individual assignment for each and every one of us. 
It's not a general assignment. As children of the living God, we have general assignment. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing men and women and bringing them in. But what is your specific assignment? As young boys and girls being born again, I was born again at a very young age, between 12 and 13, along with my sister Claire. We were living in what we would call in the, in the States, in the hood, East Ramville, Texas. And God sent his servants right there in Texas to deliver us, to set us free from sin. Of course, I would classify myself as not being a bad person. You know we do, religiously. We went to Anglican Church. We were staunch Anglicans. We got up to get to Mass for 6 o'clock. Then after Mass, we went back for Sunday school there. And then after Sunday school, we went down to Brethren Church for Sunday school. So we stayed in church. But God had a greater purpose in mind. He knew what he wanted to do on those faithful nights of those crusades. And he came and he set us free. We came out of that. And what I, what I like about everything, as we see the purpose of God and the assignment unfold, is that had I gone back and had I given that guy a satisfactory reason for him to give me that visa, I would have been out of the plan and the will of God, I'm telling you. But the time came when God said, now is the time. I wasn't interested. I, didn't, I wasn't interested in going to America. I had no desire to be in America. And it came to me. The events was, was so funny because um, when the document came, because I did the foreign nurses exam and such, such, and all the other details along with that, that brought me to this day when they literally sent the approval to my house. And... I went into them. The approval was just for myself. So when I went to the embassy, I says, um, and I was a, a, a work visa as a nurse. I was traveling as a nurse. And I said to the interviewing officer, I said, but I got my husband and the kids. He said, go home and get them. Bring everybody. I said, I got one problem. And some of you would know that I had Dion and um, Kevin, my niece and nephew. They were quite tiny at that time, and we had done all the, the, um, the paperwork to get them adopted so that wherever we are, they will be with us. For some reason, the, the attorney that we took, he took off with the money. We couldn't find the guy. So I told the guy at the embassy, I said, we have another problem here. The, we haven't completed the adoption. He says, I'll do something for you. Tell me, isn't God, when you see God is in it, Nothing can stop the hand of God. I never forgot that guy's name. His name was Christian. He said, I am going to give you a letter to take to the court. So that they can hurry up and get these children's adoption approved. God is an amazing God. I went there and everything went through. We got them adopted and we all prepared, but we still, we, we still had reservations. I don't want to go. I'm not interested in going. And God, at the same time, we consulted with Brother McGowan and um, God sent um, Dr. Dean at that time. And we sat down because we were very close and he used to be our counselor in our young marriage and as young people. And we shared with him and explained because, of course, his wife is also a nurse. So we had um, a lot of similarities and he go through all the details and he said, surely God wants you to take up that assignment. Listen to me. I'm going to be honest. I cried every single day for the first few months that I was in America. And you know how God works? We all had one-way tickets. Because I was saying to Lord, I want to go back home. I don't want to stay here. But we were broke. It's only the money that we had. We went with whatever we had. So there was no looking back. I was stuck. So I used to cry a lot. I want to go home. I don't like this place. I miss my family, my church family. I miss 
Brother Mark, I miss Brother Joe, I miss everybody. It was so bad that when Brother Joe finally showed up, I cried so much to see him. I was so happy to see him, you know. But God is in control of, 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 it, of our destiny and the assignment that he placed within our hands. And sometimes we will be thinking otherwise, but he is setting up. He is strategizing. He has a master plan for what he wants to accomplish in and through our lives. Suffice to say that we went through lots of ups and downs, lots of detours, lots of off-road off, off situations, embarrassments, pain and suffering and all of these things. But listen. God is in control. Hallelujah. And when I look at the life and the journey of Naomi. What do we say about our God? He is an amazing God. And I'm going to fast forward. Because all of these ups and downs. The valleys, the hills, all around and all that. She was going through. Lose her husband. She lost her sons. And now she... She had nothing. Remember she left her land and all that she, her possessions and they went down to Moab. Now she's coming back empty. No children, not even grandkids, nothing. That's why it's so critical for us to know the plan and the will of God for our lives. So that we can fall in line. We may not understand all the details. Had we known that this is where we were going to end up, I never knew. I was never interested in, in um, becoming a pastor's wife. You know when you just get saved, yes, I want to be a pastor's wife. But when we understand the details that goes into it, you say, no, 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 no. I don't want no part of that. And coming into leadership, you see the many struggles and the difficulties. But what I look at, the power and the anointing that comes when you see God give you an assignment. There is nothing can stop the work of God. Nothing can detour you. No matter what Paul says, people said to Paul, Paul bonds away to you. This guy came up and he said, I saw your hands stuck and tied. He said, I know. All of these things I know, but I must go. I have to go. You know, and God kept us. He preserved us. Let's look in chapter 4. After everything that happened, Ruth returned, um, Naomi returned to Jerusalem and she had to set because she had nothing but her daughter in law. And they set up a plan. I don't think Naomi knew all the details of that plan, but God placed it within her heart to tell her how to strategize. And you know what? She went to the field of Boaz and Boaz spot Ruth. And eventually she became his wife. But before that, because Naomi had nothing, there needed to be a redemption, a redeeming. And in that redemption, because Boaz had asked them, um, I can't grab the name of the one that he asked to redeem the land. And um, Naomi's possession. But in that redemption, Ruth and Naomi was also bought. You know. And what I wanted to link the two. Is that when God is working in your life. And our specific ministry. Is towards our family. And families. So you're not going alone. Right. God is sending you there. With a specific purpose. And a specific assignment. To do specific things. I cannot take on Sister Kathy's assignment I might Sister Kati might be the Moses I'm the Joshua what is God saying to you what is your specific assignment I would reiterate again what I said earlier when we became born again and I'm glad brother Roy is here now I mentioned your name earlier this morning when we became saved there was no sitting down as young boys and girls as teenagers we were tossed into Sunday school. We had to shadow the Sunday school teachers at the age of 13, 14. We went out into villages as far as we walked from East Ramvelt. 
Sometimes Roy walked from North Ramvelt and we went all the way down to the end of um, in Riverview area. Preaching. Ministering. We didn't have time for, for a lack of confidence. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he enables you. He equips you for the task at hand. And we went about and we preached and we teach. My God, listen. Again, I can say, I said this morning, greatness and ministry does not come by you sitting in the pew and absorbing everything that is given to you. You and I are called with a specific assignment and the word of God says it. Some of us are fingers. Some of us are toes. Some of us are head. Some of us are tummy. All of us have a part to play in the ministry and in the work of God. He said that we are fitly joined together. So do not say you don't have an assignment. You have an assignment. Again, it's not a general assignment. It's a specific assignment. And I'm thankful to God that after Ruth and Naomi was redeemed. And through that line came our Lord Jesus Christ. Ah, oh, Jesus, you read it for yourself. Go there, check it out, and you will see. And I believe as the people here at South Road, and we were a little smaller group than this morning, we were filled. God wants you to know that he's no longer going to accept us coming in here and sitting down and listening to Sister Bernie's or the elders and the pastors. You have a specific assignment. It's time you find out what that assignment is. Sometimes we, we, we get a little persecuted and we run. I'm not going back to that church anymore. Sister Kathy, look at me. She talked at me too hard. This one, that. Nobody is seeing me. Nobody is visiting me. Listen, I stayed in a neighborhood where we were not the ones. Myself and my sister, we would look out the window and see the brethren come and visit a certain home and and we were there looking and longing for somebody to come to see us, see about us. But we got up and we blazed that trail. Accepted the assignments that was given to us. And moved through. Oh my God. And today, moving from Guyana to America, we faced a lot as a couple. We really faced a lot. Sometimes we felt that we were all alone. And again, we were looking um, for encouragement and we couldn't find. And I used to cry about it. I said, I know if I was home because our family was very young. We had three little ones. Stefan was just three years old and the other two was just a couple of years older than him. So could you imagine, like Naomi, with these little ones, not having the support and the backing of our brethren like we used to have home. And then the Lord said one year, he says, excuse me. You were already given what you needed. Don't come again looking. Now it's time for you to pour out. I got myself up and I stopped crying. I stopped being discouraged. And I said, Lord, I am going to get up and myself and Lloyd. I mean, it was a lot. But God strengthened us. I can't tell you a lot of stuff. We'd share with Brother Joe and a few other brethren. But God saw us through. To put things succinctly, I want to say to you, God has a master plan for each and every one of us. You need to know what your master plan is. What is your assignment so that you can fit in to the master plan. And he reveals it step by step. You may not understand why you're going through what you're going through. Eh? When you're going through those things. You learn to pray. You learn to trust God. You learn to depend on him. God performed miracles. I am telling you. Literal miracles. I mean some simple things. Sometimes I just couldn't find something that was important. Searched everywhere. And out of nowhere, I'm literally telling you, I searched there and God placed it right there where I can find it. When you begin to press in, 
When you begin to walk in the will and the plan of God for your life, he reveals and he unfolds and he opens up and he sends people your way. There was one time we, we prayed, Lord, give us um, brethren that can, can stand with us, back us, even with the orphanage. My God, it, it was something so nice. I cooked and I stood there. My legs are swollen. I work like to death. He said, Angie, we got to stop. But then God began to bring it to pass, bring it to pass, bring it to pass. There was no longer, we, 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 we took all our savings and we put it into the project and there was nothing left. You know, and then God began to pour in. Once you're in the will of God, there is nothing can stop. You remember when Nehemiah, in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah was not born back there in Israel, you know. Nehemiah was born in captivity. But then he heard of what was going on in Jerusalem. He said, I can't sit here. I am going to go back there and rebuild those walls. Will you rebuild? And he never built it. But he said, those walls have to be rebuilt. Nehemiah was the king's cupbearer. That's a serious position to have. The king trusted him. He had a responsibility. How could you come now and ask the king to send me to rebuild walls? What do you know about walls? What do I know about being in America? What do you know about anything other than what's around you? But when God gave you an assignment, hallelujah, Nehemiah went to the king. He got all he needed. He said, oh, king, please give me. He asked, he said, send me back. That's the first thing he asked. And then he said, I need materials. I need protection. And he keeps adding on. And God gave him everything he needed. And Nehemiah went. And those walls were, re were rebuilt in a few days. Oh, the God that we serve, Hallelujah. The most important thing for us to know and understand today is that we must be aware that God has a specific plan and purpose for your life. Not all of us are going to become preachers. Not all of us are going to become pastors. What is your assignment? If you don't know, find out! When you hear this word today, there is no more excuse. For coming to church and sitting on the bench and hearing a good message and clapping our hands and singing and feeling good and then go back home and then become again the next Sunday. That's not why God saved us. That's what I used to do when I was in Anglican church. I went to church. I listened to the priest. I do what the priest say and then I go home and I do my own thing and then I come next Sunday. But God has a specific person. And it unveils it not all at one time. Never all at one time. Right? When God spoke to Abraham, he said, Abraham, Abraham, get up from your country. Get up from your kindred. And go to a land that I'm sending you. He never told Abraham anything else, you know. He didn't say, you're going to see this and you're going to see that this is what's going to happen. And that is what it unfolded. In portions. God has a strategic plan. And he unfolds it. And you know when we say this could not be God's plan. When? When we begin to experience pain and suffering and hardship. But if God is going to make us great. Hallelujah. If God is going to bring us. And, and give us assignments. That is going to take the world by storm. We must be ready. We must be prepared. We must be uh, in, in, a, in a state where we are not cowering and hiding and running when trouble comes. And the enemy battering and bruising us and we running for cover. You know what we do? We stand up. And like I said to Pastor Desmond and Sister Lisa. I said, you know. At one time when we were having issues with the kids and they're giving us issues. I started to cry and I took this on and I said, you know. This would not have happened. If I was in Guyana, I would have had all my brethren, everybody there counseling them and instructing them and have a nice society with beautiful examples and all of that. And like Moses, when he came up against Pharaoh, 
He said, Moses, what you got in your hand? He said, a rod. He said, use it. And God began to speak to my heart. And I began to speak against the things that, that the enemy was coming up against. I said, in the name of Jesus, listen, don't be afraid. You do not be afraid. I started to get up in the middle in the morning. One o'clock, two o'clock. I said, you want to give me trouble? I opened their bedroom doors and I began to call upon the name of Jesus. I said, the blood of Jesus, every demon, every dark force, I command you to use them. Man, like you, you know what people say, I drive the fear of God in you. And when you want to stir up, I said, you better watch it. You know what used to happen in the days gone by? If you don't listen, they, they, they carry you outside the city of Jerusalem. And you get stoned to death. But don't worry. We don't stone them to death no more. But God has a way of grabbing a hold of you. Watch out. Oh mom you don't have to say that. I am telling you it's the word of God. And I'm not going to sit by there. And allow the devil to grab you. And take you down a road. And you got me all worried and bothered. Man and God begin to move. Listen. You must stand up against the enemy. Stand up and rage war. Stand up. Don't, don't um, be on the defense. You must be on the offense. Don't react. Act. Stand up. And know what the will of God is. And dwell in it. Dwell in it. I am telling you. We cannot stand there and tell you. That everything was a smooth sailing. And there came a time when you, you felt like. You've gone off road. And he says, Lord, what am I doing here? We're there. We're going to church. We're participating. We, we did the children work for years and years. And this and that and all around. And then the Lord finally say, time up. It was time up. It was so urgent. That we did not have time to negotiate and give all the details. We just told pastor. And the leader of the um, ICLC. We got to go. We got to go. Now. Oh we want to keep. We said we got to go. Well, Go ahead. We'll give you one more Sunday. We got to go. We got to do what the Lord wants us to do. And you know what? The word of God clearly says in Romans 8, 28. All things. Come on say with me. All things. All things. Once you're a child of God. Work it together for good. And there is nothing in your life. That God will not work for your good. Remember Joseph. They meant it for evil. They meant it for evil. But poor Joseph went through. Sitting in that jail. Being accused. Innocent. But that one man. He said remember me. God works it out. He brings us into his fullness. And today I want to encourage you to rise up and know what the will of God is for you personally. Personally, and I know here at, at, in full gospel especially, and so much so in South Road. We have to know what is the assi God's assignment for us. We go to youth convention and youth camp. We listen to our leaders and we listen to our... Um, Brother Mahabir, and he would always say, after you would have finished having fun here, the Holy Spirit being baptized, being filled, be jumping up and down, rolling up in the sand. He said, go back and have a conversation with your pastor. Find out what you can do. And God begins to unfold this purpose. Let God begin to unfold this call upon your life. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. God has brought us where we are today. Now, um, I remembered we have a, a large property. Most, most of the property, we have more open space than house. The house is probably 40, and we have 100 by 100 piece of land. And I remember one time we were hosting an event for the nurses. We were coming together trying to address the situation here in Guyana. So um, Dr. Dean and his wife came down, but more so at Debbie. And we had all, a lot of other nurses who was in the diaspora. 
And we were sitting there planning, and when we were finished, I did breakfast and everything, and um, Dr. Dina says, you guys, what are you doing with this? You need to start a ministry. And that was years gone by, you know, and time drift by, but I kept these things in my heart, you know. But I know God wanted to do something. And oftentimes I would walk around the neighborhood. I would see the Jewish temple abandoned. I said, God, why don't you give us one of these? I need, we need a building. And I was thinking about our church because we didn't have a, uh, our own personal properties. I was thinking about it. I said, they ain't going to come all the way to church here. And finally, the day came when the Lord said, time to get moving. Time to get moving. And this was... In the winter season. So we just come out of summer. It is September. It's starting to get cold. And um, we decided that we're going to put up the temporary tent and we're going to keep meetings. Right? Um, Pastor William Harris, Andrea's uh, uncle, was staying with us there in the basement because he was over there for personal reasons. And uh, we started. I hung curtains in the, in the, in the temporary day tent there. And we start hosting meetings. We started hosting meetings. We started hosting meetings. And then I said to Lloyd, I said, it's getting cold. We can't host the meetings anymore. It's going to get really freezing. And on top of that, when the snow comes, it will collapse everything. So we said, well, what are we going to do now? And I thought about something. I said, let's sit down and think this thing through. And God dropped in my heart, go borrow some money. You remember what Elijah said to the widow? Go borrow your neighbor pot. You remember what, when the children of Israel was coming out to Egypt? He said, go borrow the gold. Take the gold, take everything. God was getting ready to move them out. And when you see God getting ready, once you be faithful to God, you will have to do all this sweating and sweating again. No more sowing the seeds. This, now the, the the, um, the crop is beginning to burst forth. Huh? And he made provision. We got that loan. And in those winter months, nobody would be building anything during the winter. It's too cold. That building adjoining our, ho our house was erected. Fully insulated. We use gas heaters to heat the place. Sometimes it gets so hot, we got to crack the window. But what I'm saying to you, he will provide. You be faithful to God. You honor God. Follow his lead. Find out what your assignment is. It's not going to unfold all at once. Bit by bit. Read your word. Read the Bible. And I believe today that God is saying to each and every one of us, under the sound of my voice today, I have a specific assignment for you. Some of you would have started your assignment. You got this courage. You didn't have what you needed. Come on. Let's pick up back our tools. Be like Nehemiah. Have your tool in one hand. Eh? And you're watching. Seeking God. Calling upon his name. Don't worry with the Sanballats and Tobias. Like Pastor Lloyd said, we had so much discouragement that came our way. People said nasty things. And listen, this is now ungodly people, you know. People had a lot to say, but thank God, God prepared us for what we were going to hear. I remember when we started, we had this one sister in our family. After she found out that we had left, because she had just started coming. And she said, I want to be with Pastor Lloyd and, and Sister Angela. I'm telling you, I don't want to get you feeling any nervous, but I'm, I want to encourage you. She said, after a while, we saw that she wasn't coming. And then Pastor Lloyd called and inquired, well, what happened? And, you know, finally she relented and she told, she said, somebody said to me that y'all are not real pastors. And Sister Angela is this, and you are that, and you don't, y'all don't like other people, and you only like your Guyanese people, and all kinds of negative things. I mean, our character speaks for itself. You know, and, and to me, I always say, Light is one of the humblest guys I ever known. You know, sometimes I have to tell him, come on, Light, let's go now. Um, church is finished. He would be there trying to meet with everybody and talk and chat and chat. But let me tell you something. 
The Sanballats and the Tobias are waiting. They're waiting there to discourage the work of God and the assignment that God gave you. Remember when the spies were sent into Canaan? Twelve of them went in. Only two came back with good news. Did what the other ten saw? Did they lie? No, they didn't lie. But they chose to look at the negatives. And the two said, we can take this. We can do this. There are giants in the land, yes. But guess what we saw? Grapes. The land is, is, is permed and prepped with food and good things. Let's go in. Come on, brothers and sisters. And I'm not listening to the naysayers. Because you can become very discouraged and go off course. Stand up. And I firmly believe today that God is speaking. I don't want to say some to everyone. I know some of already there are you, some of you are already involved in ministry, you're blazing the trails, but I want to remind you, the Bernie says, the brother Max, the Desmonds, they're not always going to be around. We are aging out. We are now in our 50s. When we left this country, we were in our 20s. We cannot wait around. And more than that, I think we're in a period of time when the word of God says the world is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of the living God. We have the power. We have the anointing. We are the ones that is awoke. Step in. Where, does, where do you fit in? Where do you and I fit in? Come alongside Ethiopian eunuchs. Let God transplant you. Oh, Naraba Shekere Boko Sata. Hallelujah. Let God transplant you so that you can perform those things that the world cannot. Look how many masculines in, in America and all they're talking gun control, gun control. Gun control. No. They need the power of the living God. To destroy the works of darkness. But Aaron said it. The Holy Spirit. The word of God said. And you shall receive power. Full of power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Come on. We need. Listen. Don't tell yourself you're too old. When Caleb and Joshua was done fighting and fighting for the children of Israel and situating them in, in their, their locations, when they were done, they said, give me my mountain. The strength that I had at the age of 40, I still have that strength. Why? Because they were following the blueprint of God's plan for their lives. The children of Israel walked around 40 years in the wilderness. Their shoes did not wear out. Their feet wasn't swollen. They weren't sick. Some of them died. They died because of their disobedience. But if we walk in obedience to God. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And anyone that opened up their mouth in judgment against you. He shall condemn. And you don't need to be afraid. You don't need to cower on anybody's curses or whatever they levy against you. Sometimes it could be the preachers in the church or the pastors. Some of them can become like Eli. They've lost their, their sharpness. You can become souls and become an endurance to the work of God. I'm not saying this is what is happening, but these are some scenarios. But we need to know what God is saying and we need to insert ourselves. Not extract ourselves and stand aloof. We need to be involved. Hallelujah. I am proud and I'm happy to be alive. In a time as this. Listen, I work in a unit. A pediatric unit. But it's really a young people unit. Where we have babies. And now we've stretched the age up to 26. Who have um, kidney failure. Some of them are born with kidney diseases. That cause their kidney not to function. And I'm using. My God. My Christianity. To minister to them. Oftentimes, I, I, I steal them away. I bring them. 
I had two of them in church. One got a transplant. The other one is still coming. I introduced them to the things of God. They said, oh, you mustn't proselytize and you mustn't this and that. God gave me that unit and I'm going to let the Holy Spirit move through. I was sitting there one day and I took this little one off the machine. And she started coming. She said, oh, Miss Polly, my chest. Oh, God, my chest hurts. And the next thing you know, she flunked out on me. And I immediately knew what went wrong. I can say it here. I don't want to say it over there. I believe she had an air MLI. God gave me wisdom how to operate. This is not Polly. This is not Sister Angela. What I did, I summoned help. I said, come. The other one said, call 911. I said, no 911. I am going to do this. And I started to work and all. I got the oxygen. I got everything going. And I said, hook me back up. Give me some lines. I put her back in the machine and pulled the blood right back out. Pull that air out of her body. I knew she was going to die. God is not separated from our work, our secular work, and our ministry. We take God everywhere we go. And she, after a few minutes, she sat up. I said, do you know what happened? She says, no, what happened? She was not aware. She saw death. I saw death. But she did not know. God, and I just plead the blood of Jesus. I said, Father God, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And I'm praying while my, my, my hands are moving and working. And God delivered that child and brought her back to life. I have seen the hand of God. And when you receive the power and the anointing of God, it's sufficient for any circumstance, any situation, anywhere we go, God and his power goes with us. I think I shared with you a few, some time ago, it says when you step in, devil has to step out. This is your territory. If you're the go-to person in your family, take your position. I was sharing about my sister Claire, thank God for her. I man the ship in America with all my relatives and family. She mans the ship here with all the relatives here. And we promote the name of Jesus Christ. Everything that happened. I remember my eldest brother in Trinidad. When I, I, I decided the Lord just dropped in my heart and I went to go visit him. I introduced them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. They, they, every time I call on the phone, they say, Lord Jesus Christ on the phone. Lord Jesus Christ on the phone. I said, yes. We have got to take this thing serious. We are living in critical times. We are living in the end times. And there's a purpose and a plan for God for us to take the, the word of God to the nations. And to deliver men and women. We already know the answers does not lie in the politicians. The answers does not lie in the doctors and the nurses. We all have our part to play. But the answer and the power and the anointing is what the world is waiting for. The manifestation of the sons and daughters of the living God. Hallelujah. Could we please stand? Romans 8, 19 to 21 says. And this is the, 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 the scriptures that I leave with you. It says. For the anxious longing of the creation awaits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it in hope. This is the time. This is the time. They're hoping, they're waiting, expecting that the creation itself also will be set free from its safe slavery. To corrupt, to, from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. It did not say God is going to come. The children of God. Yes, God is going to come, but he's going to come through you and I. Hallelujah. 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 We have doctors and nurses in the midst. Are we just allowing our patients to rely on the medicine? Can't we just pray with them and tell them there is a greater power? I'm going to give you this pill. But the power that comes is not in the pill. It's in God. Touching and healing your body. Setting you free. Delivering you from darkness. Hallelujah. And the final um, scripture I want to read is Jeremiah chapter 29 verses 12 
to 14. And it says, Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart and I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place where I sent you into exile. I believe this is the time. I don't know if you agree with me, but this is the time. And when we say here that you will seek me, you will find me, it doesn't mean that you are lost, that God was lost. Because now you know what we're doing? We're intently and purposefully trusting God in everything and in every area. And we will find him, Sister Kati. You will find God in your situation. You will find God when you go to pray for that person. You will find God when you seek him concerning that marriage situation. You will hear from God. You will receive from God to meet that person's need. To bring deliverance to captives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is a mighty God. And today I want us to rise. Come on, lift your hands. Call upon the Lord. If you've gone off road, you're not following the regular tracks to your destination. Things may have come, discouragements, detours, whatever you were going through. Say, God, in the name of Jesus, restore. I'm seeking you, and I know I'll find you because I'm searching for you. With all my heart, in the name of Jesus, Lord, bring a release. I let go of those things that distracted me. I release myself. Oh my God, there are situations I know. I'm telling you, you think that it's only the outsiders that affect us and cause turmoil. It might be a wife. It might be a husband. It might be the children. It's your boss. It's whoever the enemy is using to take you off course. Or to cause you to feel that you're not worthy. Huh? To take up any assignment. God has a specific assignment and I want to let you know. The assignment has an end. There are time limits on every assignment. If you, if you notice, Joshua did not fight for the Israelites until he died. It was only for a certain amount of time. God might have you here with your family because you have a specific assignment. Make sure you complete that assignment before he moves you on to anything else. And if you don't feel that it's completed, but God wants to move you on, he will pass it on to somebody else. Because when Moses died, the children of Israel did not stay on the other side. He said, Joshua, my son Moses is dead. Take up the mantle. And today God wants you because when our elders, oh my God, when our elders are coming down to their time limits or their term limits, are you there to take up the assignment or to complete the task? Are we there? Lord, please release us. We confess and we repent. Oh God, of the things that cause us to go off course. Lord God, we stand today and say, here am I. Hallelujah, King Isaiah. When you, King Uzziah died, he said, Isaiah, saw the Lord. Not only did he see the Lord, he was cleansed and ready for his assignment. He said, here am I, Lord. Send me. Send me. Come on. Lord, send me. Here am I. Send me, Lord. I don't know where you're going to take me. I don't know if I'm going to join Brother Lloyd and Sister Angela. I don't know. I've got to go to Aruni. I don't know where you're going to go, but I'm ready, Lord. I'm ready. In the name of Jesus. Let the scales fall from your eyes today. And like Brother Saul. You don't just go walking out on your own and say, I'm, I'm leaving, I'm going. I got an assignment. He sent Saul, but all Saul was so educated. He sent him to Gamaliel. He said, you go to him. And he's going to tell you what to do. 
And when you're quite ready for what he wants you to do, there will be no turning back. No matter what you face, there will be no turning back. The same it is with, with Paul. No turning back. He said, bonds await you. He said, I know. This await you, I know. But I must go. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you today for your word. And we ask that you minister to our hearts. We indeed repent and we ask you to take control once again. Bring us out of our darkness and into the light once again. Things and situations came and caused us to be bogged down and caused us to be distracted and threw off us off course. But Lord, we return and we take up that assignment with all humility. Father, we give you thanks and we give you praise. And we say, Father God, have your way in Jesus' name. God bless you.